Welcome to the latest edition of the Sabre Deadball Committee Book Talk. Tonight, we are lucky enough to have as our guest, Dennis Snelling. Dennis is the author of a number of books, three which have a lot of close relationship to the Deadball era, which is why he's the perfect guest. He's written Johnny Evers, A Baseball Life, Lefty O'Doul, Baseball's Forgotten Ambassador, and then a book on the Pacific Coast League called The Greatest Minor League, A History of the Pacific Coast League, 1903 to 1957. And we're excited to have Dennis here. So again, the, the, the way we do this is typically I will ask Dennis some questions for 30 to 40 minutes, and then uh, we open it up to, to the audience here. You guys can feel free to ask Dennis anything you want as well. So I guess my first question, Dennis, is how, how did you get interested in Sabre? Well, I always loved baseball history, and I think I became aware of those uh, the minor league guides that were put out and uh, some of the minor league stars. And uh, I think that got me interested. Plus, at the time, I was thinking I'd always wanted to write books. And uh, so this is the, the, the late 80s when I first joined and uh, so that's how I got interested. I became aware of them as a source uh, of information and like minds and uh, have enjoyed it ever since. And sort of, did you become, how did you get started as a writer? Was that before you were in Sabre and you were looking at Sabre as a way to help you with your writing or you got into Sabre and you realized some of the opportunities that were out there and you decided, okay, I think I can expand on my knowledge here and actually and go write some stuff? I think it was about the same time. Uh, I was very interested. I'd always been interested in players with very brief forays into the major leagues. You know, John Pachorek being a, you know, a typical example or, you know, one game goes three for three and what happened to them. So I'd been kicking around that idea for a while and then Field of Dreams came out and that sort of crystallized, oh, okay, there's stories behind these people and got me interested in thinking about how could I look at baseball through the lens of these guys? You know, I, I reasoned that Willie Mays never had to worry about whether he should still play when he's 25 but Ed Sinicki did, you know, do I keep <laughs> playing when my kids are, when we're moving all around the country and there's no guarantee I'm going to make it. So it was kind of uh, at that same time. And again, finding people who had backgrounds and interests uh, that hooked me into Bill Weiss, who helped me quite a bit with the first book and tracking down statistics for players. You didn't have statistics on the internet in 89, 90, 91. So it, it helped connect me to, people, but I kind of discovered that as I went along. Um, I would say they kind of went hand in hand. Yeah, and maybe you just want to describe your first book because we probably aren't going to talk about it here, but just sort of how you got got your got going on, on your first book, which is always the hardest one to figure out what you want to do with it. Sure. There'd been this guy, uh, I grew up in Modesto, and there was this guy who used to hang out on the park bench named Jack Gilligan, we talked about pitching against Ty Cobb, and that just always stuck in my mind, and he played very briefly in the major leagues. And kind of put that away, and then I you know, got the baseball encyclopedia when I was a kid, and you'd see all these oddball statistics of players who played one game or, or just a few games. And so I always wondered, you know, what had happened to them. So when Field of Dreams came out and you had the Moonlight Graham character, it kind of kicked off, hey, you know, there's probably stories behind a lot of these guys. And what I tried to do was find something different in each one. So you had uh, Ron Netchai, who struck out 27 guys in a minor league game, but blew out his arm when he was 21. And then what does he do with the rest of his life? Or or uh, uh, Burt Shepard, who lost his leg in World War II and then pitched and tried to play ball afterwards. So it was finding, you know, I didn't want the stories all to be repetitive. And I interviewed all of the players and they're basically biographical essays uh, partially in their voice with my providing some background, almost like a documentary script uh, feel without being a script. And so that was the first book. It was called A Glimpse of Fame. And I had like so, 15 of these guys, uh, 15 different players, ranging from the 1930s into the 1970s when they played. And you 
found them? Um, you managed to find all of them or most of them? Yeah. No, uh, I, the ones that yeah. are in the book are ones yeah. I found. There were three or four that that uh, I interviewed that I didn't use. Uh, one guy, it was just too difficult, still hurt too much to have not made it. And so he stopped in the middle. And so I honored that. And then there were a couple of others that were just too similar in theme to some of the others. So, but um, I only included people that I actually talked to. Speaking of themes and narrative flow and, and how things look, I mean, you, you, you did two biographies, John Evers and Lefty O'Doul. And I think, you know, both of them, great narrative flow. They're fun to read. You, you know, they, they, they keep moving. And, you know, sometimes that's hard to do with, with biography. H how have you sort of found, worked through the, the process of making sure you have a nice narrative flow and you, you know, you get the big themes, but you also get the important deal details, but not too many so that book kind of slogs, but what, what is it just feel or how, how would you describe how you create sort of that narrative path to a biography? Well, I think it's, it kind of reveals itself as you go along what, what the book should be and what the themes are. I try to look for threads that I can kind of weave in and out. Um, and then to me, editing is just one, I enjoy it and it's very interesting, but I do about six different types of edits. So I will read the book aloud and see how does it sound. Then I will do for narrative flow. And then I'll go back and look for, have I explained everything? Am I, have I left something out where it doesn't make sense? Then I'm looking for sentence structure in another type of edit where I'm looking for things that as I read through them, I'm going, I'm not crazy about the way I worded that. And I'll go back and keep playing with that and, and, and fix it. And then looking for repetitive words and phrases, not repeating the same thing over and over again uh, so that it flows and then reading it aloud again. So there, so there's a lot of editing and different and looking at it in different, you know, there's a fact check edit that I, that I'll do and I'll read the whole thing, the whole chapter basically that way. Then the other part is the opening of the book is incredibly important. And actually I think the opening of each chapter and the end of each chapter where you want someone to continue reading. And then I try not to, uh, I try to leave places where the reader fills in the blank, where I don't necessarily tell them everything, but I, I lead them to a point where, oh, okay, this is what this means to make them an active reader as much as possible. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> you know, I can't say that I'm entirely su successful uh, all the time, but that's what I try to do. And these two biographies are really different from each other because they're very different people. They have some commonality. One of the first things I did with both is I created uh, game logs for Evers. Uh, baseball reference hadn't gone back that far yet. So I had to do both his minor and major league. And it took me about a month. I could do about two months a day. And I would go through usually uh, like um, uh, base, uh, sporting life was real good, had, had all the box scores. And I'd also record where they bat in the batting order, uh, what were the fielding stats, and then any notes about a particular game. And then I could start seeing patterns. I could see if, if someone missed a few games, I could go back. Now I want to go back to the game before. Did they get hurt? Whatever and kind of look at those patterns. And then what kind of player were they? Did they get dropped in the batting order at a certain point? Maybe something happened and, and gives you clues what's going on. So that would be the first thing that I did. But I quickly, you know, Evers I see as more of a character study and a psychological study. Um, his is really the story of, of what competitive, uh, what a truly, really competitive person does to the point where competitiveness really co entirely consumed him and eventually uh, destroyed him in a way, both his personal life and his professional life. Uh, and then Odul was much more historical. Uh, if you're trying to place him in a historical perspective, I felt like he was arguably the most important player who hadn't had, or most important baseball figure who had not had a true biography of him. And I kind of got into him via a glimpse of fame. One of the players that I wrote about was Joe Brovia, who played 
in the Pacific Coast League, and his story is about finally getting his shot in the major leagues at age 33 and being there for a month, and that's it. And he played for Lefty, and there were a couple of other guys that I talked to. And so that led into uh, basically 60 to 65 interviews I did that I used for both Lefty O'Doul and the greatest minor league uh, to kind of fill in the blanks. But the other piece that I think is finding little details that flesh things out that make you feel like you're there, you know, whether it's descriptions of the diamond, you know, maybe it's a, a really dusty diamond all the time and dust flies everywhere. Well, you can work that in. Or what was someone wearing that day or a little superstition, something that makes you feel like you're there. I'm always looking for those types of things. And what's nice is the old newspaper accounts are very descriptive. There's not as many quotes if you go back in the 19 teens and 20s of players, but there's a lot of description of what's going on. Same time, you kind of have to use your judgment. Some things make sense and some don't and trying to figure out what to use and what, what not to use. So those are some of the things yeah. that I try to do in my narratives. No, I think I appreciate that. I, I think that's all great. I mean, it's hard to make it make a comment. I, I do think that, you know, the descriptions, like you say, I also, it's funny, you know, we, we've been doing this now. I don't, I think you're our fourth or fifth and there's a different answer to that question all the time, uh, how, how you do it. But, you know, the people obviously we've talked to have, have done a really nice job of it. So I, it's impressive. And I'm, I'm definitely impressed with the way you do the proofreading for, you know, you, you, you proof it six times or edit it six times and look for something a little bit different each time, because that's, I, I, that's an interesting way to do it. And I, I haven't tried that, but I think I've, I think I'd like to, because it sounds like it's an easier way to keep from missing things and, and concentrate on stuff. One of the most valuable things I do is read it aloud. Mm -hmm. Now, at the same time, I write, tend to write long sentences at times, and you, you don't breathe in your head. So sometimes it's, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> you find out this isn't like a script, and you realize <laughs> the difference between writing a script and writing a book. But that's one of the things where those things will stick out. Typos will stick out, and so will tone. You know, is my tone consistent? Uh, am I being too snarky here? Am I trying to be too funny? Those things will come out. I find they come out when I read it aloud. Why don't you share a little bit about how you research your topics? It sounds like, you know, Odul was based on interviews and I'm guessing Evers, given how long ago that was, 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 was pretty much newspapers and digging around in archives, the Hall of Fame and elsewhere. Maybe talk a little bit about how you attacked each of the each of the biography subjects and, and, and the Pacific Coast League, too, if you want to share something sure. uh, about how you did that. Well, um, one thing I believe in is keeping a healthy dose of skepticism about every story you've heard or will hear. And so that means newspaper accounts or interviews. Well, and even with interviews, ballplayers are notorious for not being uh, entirely accurate in their memories. <laughs> And, and embellishing stories a little bit. So uh, you kind of have to, you know, what I try to do is go back to the actual source as close as possible or the source itself at the time. And I try to pick the newspaper that makes sense geographically. So if Lefty O'Doul is playing in Des Moines, I try to follow, I try to get Des Moines newspapers. There's a lot more online now. Uh, but in the past, uh, especially for greatest minor league, uh, you know, there I was uh, the state library here in Sacramento had pretty much every California newspaper on microfilm. And actually, uh, they've gotten to where you can take images and actually email them to yourself. So it's it's wonderful. Yeah. And then uh, they had the Portland and Seattle newspapers. So that was helpful. Uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, I visited theirs. They had uh, a lot of Washington, Utah, and and, uh, and then even Nevada papers. Uh, for instance, Walter Johnson almost signed in the Coast League in 1925, the year after he won the World Series. He was going to buy into the Oaks, and he lived in Reno. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. And then uh, just various libraries, UC Berkeley, I used uh San Diego State University, where I'm an alumnus of there, I went there. So it was 
going to libraries, looking at a lot of microfilm. Uh, now you can do much more of it with newspapers.com and Genealogy Bank is also a really good source. They fill in a lot of places, especially with smaller towns that newspapers.com don't have. And then just writing to, you know, for the Greatest Minor League and Lefty O'Doul, writing to players and seeing if they were willing to be interviewed, uh, you know, using address lists and, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then also talking to people who might know somebody who knows one of these folks and uh, just trying to make contacts that way. Those are, there's no shortcut to it. <laughs> you find that right. out pretty quickly. Yeah, no, it's a lot of it's a lot of libraries. Yeah, and a lot of interviews, especially if for someone even as even as far back as Lefty O'Doul, you forget how many interviews you can actually try and try and do there. Uh, you know, um, one example yeah. I I can think of of going back to a source and taking a different look at a famous quote was Evers, where he talked about the only good umpire is a is a dead umpire. Well, I found the uh, it was actually in a magazine section of the New York Herald in, in I can't remember what year off top of my head, but uh, he'd probably been imbibing a little bit because he'd first talked about his, he was, he was talking about his wife uh, in a complimentary way and then uh, said, talk, did the umpire quote and then said, and Chicago has the prettiest women in the country. <laughs> which wasn't a great thing to say with his wife there, but because um, she wasn't from Chicago. Uh, <laughs> so she's from Troy, <laughs> Troy, New York. So it gives you a different perspective sometimes if you can go back and find these little nuggets like that. Fun. You you talked a little bit about what drew you to uh, Lefty O'Doul sort of being the most interesting or famous or impactful uh, person that didn't have a biography about him and feel free to embellish that. And, and then what about Evers? I mean, what, what made you decide that he might be someone you'd like to write about? Well, I'll kind of do it in order. Evers was kind of an experiment because I hadn't done a biography. And originally that book was going to be about the Miracle Braves. And uh, Charles Alexander was doing a book at the same time on the Miracle Braves, but also with McFarland. So that shut that door. And it was suggested to me, well, why don't you do a biography of someone from that team, like Evers or Marinville or, you know, and so uh, I said, okay, let me do Evers. Let me write a first chapter and see if I can find, if I'm interested in him. And so I wrote the first chapter, sent it off to McFarland and said, what do you think of this approach? They liked it. And that ended up being uh evers i really didn't know what to expect and i was he kind of surprised me and and uh to me he kind of invented modern second base play um, you know the swipe tag and one-handed catches and things like that with a, this tiny glove that was no bigger than your hand at the time and then just his competitive nature uh, and the psychology of that just really interested me so i didn't really start out thinking of a biography at that point. I was going to do a story of, of a team in, in one year. And uh, and then that year is kind of interesting because you also have the Federal League, you have Babe Ruth's entrance into baseball. They're coming off the world tour. And I'm still playing around with the idea of doing a book on the 1914 season, not necessarily just on the Miracle Braves, but I was going to touch on some of these other areas. And I always had O'Doul in mind that I wanted to do his biography because I just felt I knew a lot about the Pacific Coast League. I felt that I knew enough uh, to, to talk about him. The one thing I did with both is I did not make an argument whether they should be in the Hall of Fame or not. And that was deliberate um, because I didn't want either book to turn on a debate over whether they should be in the Hall of Fame or not. What I wanted it to do is talk about these guys, give you a sense of who they were. And I wanted that to be the focus. And uh, so I didn't explicitly in either of those say, you know, Evers is in the Hall of Fame and really belongs there because he was one a little less so now, but 10 years ago, he was one of those that was always noted as, a, you know, People brought their friends into the Hall of Fame that really shouldn't have been in there. 
Um, and Odul, there's, as, as you said, uh, you know, some people think he should be in there. Um, I just kind of laid it out. He's in the Japanese Baseball Hall of Fame for his contributions to baseball there. He's in just about every other Hall of Fame, San Francisco Hall of Fame and Pacific Coast League Hall of Fame. Uh, but I just kind of, I think you can make, draw your own conclusions. And it's, it's more about saying he's an important figure for what he did to help uh, Japanese baseball, what he was as a hitting instructor, what he was as a, as a minor league manager who sent players to the, to the majors, and what he was as a player. He was a spectacular player for a short period of time, but he was stuck in the Pacific Coast League at a time when the Pacific Coast League was trying to become a third major league and was holding on to their players. And so he's playing arguably major league level, but in a minor, stuck in a minor league and doesn't get out of there until he's 31 years old after failing as a pitcher earlier. Um, Ever, Evers was a lot easier to write as far as it was pretty straightforward. Odul was a lot tougher because the challenge there was you have someone who really wasn't successful until they're 31 years old. And you have to remember, there's some people who are going to read this who know who he is, and there's some who don't know who he is. And I was concerned that, okay, I could be writing, they could be reading into chapter four going, who is this guy and why am I reading about him? Because he hasn't done anything. <laughs> right. And so this, the problem there was, okay, what made him important was the Japanese factor. So I used the 1949 tour, broke it into pieces and used that as the introduction to each chapter, a piece of that tour. And then uh, the other problem that I ran into is there's a period of time in the 30s and 40s where he um, he was a, a tremendous hitting instructor. Other teams would bring their players to him, but he was kind of a mentor to Joe DiMaggio and Ted Williams and Dom DiMaggio and Ferris Fain. But he was also, he had been a, pitcher and incredibly he was a great teacher of pitchers and Larry Jansen was one that he had a great influence and Ryan Duran and all these and then there was he was he was helping start he got Babe Ruth to go to Japan and he was starting to help Japan uh, pre-war uh, create their own major league uh, so there was that piece and then there he was the top manager in the Pacific Coast League he had all these three things going on and I didn't want to spend three or four chapters ping-ponging back and forth because I thought all three of these things were really important. So I decided some people liked this approach and some people didn't. I did parallel chapters uh, from the 30s and 40s, uh, the first chapter talking about uh, Japan and then the next chapter going back to the, you know, through the 40s and then coming back to the 30s and that same time period and talking about what he was as a hitting instructor then going back and doing the managing and then picking it back up after that and finishing off his life. But I wanted to, that was, he was a big challenge and he was a big challenge psychologically too. I'd say it took a year and a half to get my brain wrapped around who he was and realize he really didn't have a private persona. He was a public figure who was energized by people and really was lost if he wasn't around people. So his marriage has kind of failed and he didn't really, there's not a lot about his wives. He didn't have any children because that wasn't a big part of his life, mm. frankly. And so it took me a while to get that. Uh, you know, I did uh, Tom O'Doul, who's a cousin, uh, second cousin of his, was a good resource. And so they each, they each provided their separate challenges, uh, especially structurally. But even psychologically, Evers was pretty straightforward in who he was and what happened to him. The thing they had in common is they both uh, remained in the public eye their whole life, which makes a big difference for a biographer. That you, can, <laughs> you know, And I love beginnings and endings. And you'll see that I put a great emphasis on, on both, not just their highlights of their careers. Because I think that's where you really reveal who a person is how do they react to different situations in their lives and uh, they both you know evers was interesting because he stayed so current with the game i remember the story of uh, him already saying hey carl hubble's going to lose his stuff 
he just finished his fifth 20 win season. This is in 1946 before two years before, or about a year and a half before Evers dies. And he's saying, uh, Hubble's falling off. And, and he did, he saw something that other people didn't see. Hubble, I think had led the league in strikeouts and won 20 games for the fifth straight year. And he said, he's, he's going to lose it. And so it was interesting with both these guys, they stayed in the public eye. They were both very interesting people. There's a lot of quotes. They love talking to the press and those things help. Right. Maybe just given it were as a transition, a little bit on sort of what was a couple of one, maybe just one of the most surprising things that you found on each that you didn't expect to find or that, you know, just something that popped up in your research that you said, wow, this is, I'm surprised at this. Um. Well, uh, it's not a big thing, but it was really interesting. Johnny Evers, the 1915 season, everybody talks about 1914 when the, the Miracle Braves. But 1915, they almost did it again. And a lot of it was because Evers missed uh, almost two months and ended up playing the whole second half of the season on a broken ankle and almost rallied them to win a second pennant. And just the grit to fight through that. Um, and then I really enjoyed writing about him uh, trying to make the Re the Boston Red Sox in 1918 and rooming with Babe Ruth. That was a, <laughs> what an interesting yes. dichotomy those two would have been. Yeah. The, you know, the past and the future of the game uh, in, in one room. Um, I think, and then some of the inaccuracies, you know, uh, the feud with him and Tinker uh, was was not as long. It, you know, some some instances talk about thirty years. You know, you no. Know, by the Federal League, Tinker was trying to get Evers to play uh, with his team when he jumped to the Federal League. So they had their problems that related to a a fight in 1905 in Bedford, Indiana, and uh, you know that's pretty well documented. But I would say that they talked to each other. They probably weren't the greatest of friends for a while, but uh, some of that. With a duel, I think um, it was realizing how important, you know, one of the most valuable things I got was uh, someone handed to me, Paul Fagan, the SEALs owner, had commissioned uh, English uh, translations of all the Japanese newspaper coverage and seeing what the impact that he had on the Japanese. Uh, you know, I, I thought he was important, but that really validated it and uh to recognize and then what what a really good hitter he was i mean there was a streak in the coast league he went 19 for 20. there was uh you know he the year that uh he had in philadelphia he hit 32 home runs and struck out only 19 times you won't see that anymore <laughs> and, uh, so i think uh those would probably be the things i can think of off the top of my head so we talked a little about writing biography and what surprised you. The writing the history of a league has to be a completely different challenge. I, I mean, it seems that way to me. Maybe you feel differently on what the challenges are, but talk a little bit about what the challenges were of writing about, you know, 55 years of a league and and how you approached it. I mean, what what was – and did you have multiple – did you have to change your approach as you, after you started and you said, nope, you know, I want to try doing X as opposed to Y? It's It seems sort of like a daunting task and it – isn't really done enough that there's just not a lot of good models for it either. It was a seven year writing uh, thing. And it really went from the 1890s to the 19, late 1950s because the league really came out of the old California State League, uh, which also had a lot of ex major leaguers uh, play in it. And uh, the idea originally was to, at the time that I started this, the Angels were owned by Disney. And I thought it was interesting that uh, the original Los Angeles Angels in the early 1900s were owned by a guy named Jim Morley, who built a whole amusement park right around the team and married that idea of entertainment and baseball together. And he was one of the first who did that so explicitly. And I thought that was interesting and in how it kind of came full circle in a way. And so the idea was to talk about the Coast League, but also in the context of how the West Coast changed so much from Los Angeles being a town of little orange groves to being this mammoth metropolis, one of the world's great cities. 
in a in a blink of an eye in terms of history and and uh san francisco and and then how it was kind of the battle of the league to try to become a third major league which the regular major leagues were never going to allow them to do so they started the first year as an outlaw and really they and the american league were the only outlaws who successfully challenged organized baseball and survived you know versus the federal league the old american association union association inter state league all those other uh, attempts they actually did survive now they didn't survive in the way they wanted to and they became weaker over time where the american league became you know a partner uh so that was kind of the original is going down a lot of rabbit holes and in fact the book is pretty long it's it's over 200,000 words as it is but it's cut in half from what it was and uh, I think it's a better book. Uh, I tried to get them to market it in two volumes, but again, editing, I do like editing. And one of the differences with the greatest minor league, it allowed me to look at a lot of different factors from how television came to be. Because television was partially invented in San Francisco in a lab on Green Street by uh, Philo T. Farnsworth. And, uh, had the first successful demonstration and and radio was big in the bay area and how it impacted uh the minor leagues especially and you get into race relations you know you had a, a player who snuck across the color line in 1916 for a week and then you know i could talk about a, a player named bill lane in 1919 who should have been a major leaguer but wasn't john mcgraw wanted to sign him but couldn't because his skin color was wrong and point out that discrimination wasn't only on the in the South. It was in the West, where black players couldn't stay at the Senator Hotel in Sacramento into the 1950s. Um, you know, Mudcat Grant talked, I interviewed him and talked about how spring training was still segregated in 1957 in Southern California. So you could get into a lot of these different areas. Um, the Pacific Coast League had its own Black Sox scandal uh, that happened at the same time that involved some of the same people who were involved in the Black Sox scandal. And a lot of the ex-Black Sox had come from the PCL, including Lefty Williams and Swede Risberg and Chick Gandle. And uh, Sleepy Bill Burns was uh, a Coast League pitcher. And being able to look at that, you had players who were banned for life from that at the same time the Black Sox scandal was going on. And Nate Raymond was the money man, the, who's still one of the people who is suspected in Arnold Rothstein's death. Nobody knows what happened to Arnold <laughs> Rothstein. And Ch Hal Chase was yeah. involved in this in, as the money man, the go-between in the Coast League scandal, where they, one team was trying to throw the pennant to another. And then, so a lot of the interesting stories, too, just didn't fit the narrative. And so you'll find that there's really voluminous footnotes. With some of the best stories are actually in the footnotes of that book. Uh, I think the 1919 scandal goes earlier than people talk about. And I talk about a series that's a few months earlier that's pretty suspicious, and but it didn't really fit in the narrative flow. Mm -hmm. And so I stuck it in the back. And the idea with that was, I'm going to give you all this stuff. And there's a lot of rabbit holes people could go down. So look at this, and it may lead you to someone else wanting to do something in an article or something. It kind of gives you the start to things. And I was really intrigued with being able to do that. So, yeah, I don't think I would try something that large again, uh, but it was a lot of fun, and and uh, I'm I'm happy with how it came out. Great, great book, um, absolutely. Was it hard to again sort of was it hard to figure out how you wanted to do the structure there? I mean, you talked a little about all Lefty O'Doul and your conundrum and his some of the stuff he was doing in the 30s and 40s when he did parallel chapters was was sort of the chronological of. I mean, did you try and, you know, you, you grouped it into eras, but I mean, was there any, was there, were there any conundrums in terms of how you had to lay it out? No, everything fit pretty well because I could take a three to four year span and there would be something major that would be the theme. You know, there were obviously other stories going on, but there would be one central theme for that chapter. I love creating chapter titles and, uh, you know, so Obviously, 1919 to 1921, you're talking about the, the scandal that broke, uh, you know, and I think uh, 
I think I called it lying tigers and bees. Oh my. And <laughs> because it was the Salt Lake bees and the Vernon tigers. And uh, I like wordplay sometimes. I've uh, some of my books, I hide the titles of the other books in, in there somewhere. Uh, you know, I'll throw in a phrase. Um, I remember I got stuck on Lefty Duel once talking about, um, there was a story about how he and his buddy had gone to the racetrack and came and missed the game. They thought it was going to be rained out and it wasn't. Miller Huggins didn't even miss them. That's how unimportant they were. Well, you know, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that that's really the case. But I said it would be trite to say that that uh, O'Doul felt like a prisoner, uh, you know. But uh, and then I just went on to say, but it did reflect his feelings. So it's like I knew it was a bad sentence, and I just ignored <laughs> it and, said, and just played with it. That's and cool. I like doing that sometimes. I hope I don't do that too much. But um, you know, I think that one the the structure if i did three to four year slots there was something that was kind of the definitive story of that era sometimes it was a fight for the league presidency at one point sometimes it was a franchise shift uh you know so i could find something that made a logical uh breaking you know break point uh for it when then i could within that i would Ex, you know, explore a little bit more on that main topic and then talk about the other things that were happening in the league at the time. So maybe we'll, great, thank you, um, relative to the to, to those books. Maybe we'll just move on and sort of the last few questions have to do with just your writing, your style, and then maybe what you're doing, thinking about going forward. So just how long does it typically take you to write a book? It sounds like all of these had quite different approaches and quite different time frames. So how, is there a typical and how, how, how would you view these? Well, these were all three different. Evers, Evers, I, I always go back and forth. <laughs> I, I mean, I've, I've, I, I say, say, everyone tells me it's Evers. I've actually seen reports though in an old sporting news that it was Evers. So, I, that, so I, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I don't know. He, I understand he answered to either. And, you know, but um Evers was, again, probably took a little over a year. And he doesn't have any uh, living descendants. Um, his only only living child, he had a, a daughter who died at, uh, young and a son who didn't have any children. So there was really no family. I, I reached out to some distant relatives but didn't hear. So that one was pretty straightforward, pretty much newspaper accounts and, and photographs and things. Odul took about two and a half years, I would say, and the Greatest Minor League took about seven. Um, so, as far as what else I'm working on, I'm in the home stretch of a book on the 1950 Whiz Kids. Right. Um, I got interested. Well, first of all, I came across uh, their general ledger uh, and acquired that from the 1949 to 52 season. So has a lot of financial information in it that was interesting. And then I kind of got interested in how was that, how was a team built? And then you have a team, I think, I can think of three teams that lost the World Series and had a singular event and still became famous. The Go-Go Sox of 59, the Impossible Dream Red Sox of 67, and the Whiz Kids of 50. Other than that, there are teams that lost, you know, the Black Sox obviously are infamous for losing, but they'd also won in 1917. So it wasn't just this one shot thing, but these three teams were kind of one shot teams. And so how was the team built and then why didn't it make it? And then, of course, you have the Eddie Waitkiss issue with the shooting uh, that you can weave into this and, and you know, the, the Philly slowness to integrate. There's a lot of little threads there to explore. And uh, so I found I found that very interesting, and I'm kind of in the in the uh, end stages of that. And then uh, the 1914 season, I have, I'm about sixty thousand words into that. I've kind of gone back and forth. That starts with the uh, basically it starts with a scene with Tris Speaker seeing ten one thousand dollar bills laid out, fifteen one thousand dollar bills laid out <laughs> on the yes, table by the federal. That that's that's kind of the opening of the book. And uh, then goes back and goes through the 1913 World Tour, 
and then the 1914 season, which again has a lot of interesting threads. You have you have Babe Ruth making his professional debut. You have the Federal League and and those issues, and of course the Miracle Braves and and that pen race and and John McGraw uh, kind of uh, you know in his prime, and so kind of exploring those. Someday I wouldn't. I might want to tackle a biography of McGraw. I think he's just a very interesting figure, and I think there's still more to say about him, but uh, I haven't started anything like that. He's a fascinating guy, absolutely. Uh, just one final question. What would you say is the most important lesson that you have would take away from writing or, or that you've learned in writing that you would share with everybody here? Well... It's looking for, well, you, the bottom line is you have to be interested in it and be willing to live with it for a long period of time. If you're not interested enough, no one else is going to be. You know, I've had other projects that I've started and I just didn't feel like I could live with it either. If it's a biography, you've got to, can I live in this guy's brain and skin for two years? You know, am I willing to do that? Um, because you, you know, that was, I think that's what you need to do to do a successful biography. Um, you've got to get to know the person a little bit. And some people you want to get to know, and some people you might not want to. <laughs> or you just might not right. find them interesting enough. Or maybe it's too repetitive with other things you've talked about. Um, so I guess that's probably, and then, and then it's just keep writing. Writing, you only get, I feel like I'm still developing and finding my voice and each book. Now I go back to the previous one and go, man, I would probably edit that in a little different way. And it's like exercise. It's just the more you write, the better you're going to get. I've enjoyed writing some little stories for Sabre. Uh, one about uh, Jerry Sullivan, uh, who was uh, a dwarf who played in 1905 and actually got a base hit in a minor league game. And, uh, Another one about a, a minor league team that shifted to Roseville, California, near where I am, and lasted two weeks uh, before having to move. And that, you know, those little oddball stories interest me too. But basically, you have to be interested in what you're writing if you want other people to be interested, and you got to commit to it. Appreciate it. Well, I have no more questions. I think that's a great way to end it uh, before we open it up relative to. Yeah, you gotta you gotta love your topic because, as you say, you live with it for a long time. Questions? If you want to raise your hand, I will. Let me just look at. I will call on you, and hopefully, I can figure out how to do this. I can't see everybody, but um, I think I can figure out who has their hand up. So, or just if you aren't on the screen, feel free to yell it out too. Well, I, I, I see Donald Jensen. Down there, yep, yeah. thanks. Yep, you're doing better than me. Go ahead, Don. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dennis. And again, of course, Dan, you're going to thanks. Uh, this is really interesting. Now, two questions about Lefty or two comments. I would like your reaction. One is that like a lot of old, other old time San Franciscans, he was reluctant to embrace Mays. And like my dad who played my... The, the Maggio uh, crush affected a lot of people for a long time afterward. And I have the Ritter book here and uh, the famous quote from O'Doul that Mays couldn't hit and that he, he and Cobb were both at 340, but Cobb was 73. Do you, do you have anything else on that reluctance to embrace the Giants? And second, uh, by my Dan, the second one is the issue of Finding whatever he did for Japanese baseball, which was kind of the, the subhead to his fandom in the city. Uh, clearly, a lot of Japanese played baseball before he was involved, and there's a lot of good research from the dead ball era about that. But could you say a little bit more about what he did in Japan? Thank you. Okay, uh, I'll first talk about the maze issue and the and the Larry Ritter piece. In in looking at where Lefty was. Um, he was very excited when the Giants moved 
1958. And up to that time, he was not one of those. What was interesting about him is he was not one of those guys who always talked about, oh, the old players were better. And oh, woe was me. That changed because the Giants didn't really embrace him. Uh, Stoneham did, Horace, uh, Horace Stoneham did, because uh, he'd known him as when he was young back in New York, uh, when he played for the New York Giants. And he'd gotten to the point where he was, uh, he would do like spring uh, training hitting. And he worked with Cepeda, Philippe Lou, uh, Willie McCovey, uh, had a lot to do with turning McCovey. He was asked to turn McCovey into a, a pull hitter, which McCovey didn't exactly love. And um, by 63, when, when Ritter interviewed him, he had just uh, left the Giants. He'd done his last duty for them. And what ended it for him was a young player uh, was said, hey, O'Doul wants to work with you. And he goes, O'Doul, who's he? And Lefty just kind of walked away. And each year he was a little bit more bitter. And he changed into this person, <laughs> the stereotypical guy who who talked about the old players like Cobb was so much better, which was very different for him. He kind of snapped out of it uh, in the late 60s. The Giants put on a, a day for him, and that meant a lot to him. And he started to be remembered and honored. And I think he kind of snapped out of that a little bit. And uh, he and Mays got along pretty well towards the end uh, when Lefty died. But I think the whole Ritter interview is right about that time and that's just kind of my guess and observation uh, based on what I saw about him up to that time. It's, it's just a time when he was kind of down and uh, he'd, he'd just gone through the last time he was going to be up on the Hall of Fame ballot. And so there were so he was probably bitter at that point. As far as what he did for Japan, he was able to get Babe Ruth to go to Japan. Uh, <laughs> the Japanese have been trying to get him to go come over in the postseason for about a decade. And he had a relationship and finally uh, working with uh, uh, the J uh, Japanese side of things, uh, managed to get him over there and then stayed behind and helped the Japanese form their first uh, major leagues. And uh, he continued making trips over there up till about 1937, 38. He would go over and instruct college players. He understood the culture, loved the culture, uh, they really appreciated him. And then after the war, uh, the Japanese, uh, well, Douglas MacArthur was looking for some way of uh, helping uh, Japanese morale that uh, the communists were making inroads. It was tough. You know, Japanese uh, were in rubble. Orphans were everywhere, uh, you know, and not taken care of. It was hard to get food to eat. Uh, it was a very tough time. And they looked at athletics maybe being a way to revive things. And O'Doul, Babe Ruth had died in 48. And so in 1949, O'Doul was the most popular American athlete among the Japanese. And so uh, it was between him and Bob Feller bringing an all-star team over to Japan. And they chose O'Doul and he came. And the outpouring was amazing. There was a, a million people lined the streets in Tokyo when he got there. And uh, after that, he took Joe DiMaggio the next year in 1950 and brought Joe and, and Marilyn Monroe famously in 1954. Uh, he took a major league all-star team in 51, and that kind of started the Americans uh, going over regularly. Thank you. Uh, Dixie, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh, Dennis, thanks a lot for talking to us tonight. Great program. Uh, I think, if I recall correctly, that Johnny Evers' daughter died during the 1914 season. Yes. I remember doing work on it and seeing him missing for a couple of weeks, a month, and that's why he was missing. Yes, in August. Uh, and he got a telegram, I think it was on August 7th, and uh, she was buried on August 8th. She was already had passed when he got the, the uh, telegram. And yeah, he was out for about a week. But he came back and finished the season. But he had a lot of tragedies in his life. He had a situation where he was driving a car and got in an accident with a trolley. And uh, it killed his best friend, died right in front of him. And he didn't drive much after that. And uh, it led 
the next year he had a nervous breakdown. Uh, what was interesting is he conflated the two. He he talked about the accident leading to the nervous breakdown, but they were in separate years. And he he talked about that in 1913. He was mixing up 1910 and 1911, which again, that's that part of skepticism you have to have these stories and go back and as best you can. You're not going to catch everything, but you try to catch everything you can. But uh, yeah, you're right. He had he had a tragedy right at one of the high points of his of his life. My writer's question is, uh, I don't do books, but I write short stuff, uh, newsletter stuff for the dead ball era and for the 19th century and by bi the biographies and the game stories, all that good stuff. Uh, but any time that I do write any of that, I send it out to friends of mine for a read because mm -hmm. I want someone else who knows not as much as I do to read it and tell me, is it OK? Does it flow? Can you understand this? Have you ever considered sending out a, a chapter to some trusted friend saying, okay, rip this to shreds? Oh, yeah. I have a friend named Jim Norby has read all of my books. And then each one, I also tried to pick someone who knew something uh, about the subject. Uh, Yoichi Nagata on the Left Yo Duel read the Japanese portions for me. Uh, he was introduced to me by Rob Fitz. Uh, they together won the um, baseball Research Award last year uh, on the uh, the books on the Japanese tours. And uh, then uh, Dick Beveridge was really helpful, uh, read the whole manuscript of Lefty O'Duel, as did another uh, Sacramento baseball historian, Alan O'Connor. And what I look for them is, is there something that doesn't make sense? Have I thought I explained something? A lot of times you know it and you forget to explain it fully. Or is there a factual thing that's wrong? Or is it just not coming, is it seeming confusing or doesn't flow? So yes, I agree, that's a that's a vital thing to do. Uh, it's very helpful for me and I, I think for any writer like yourself. Thank you. Steve? Hey, I think Steve. you're on mute, Steve. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about the fact that uh, he stuck around with Miller Huggins for a few years, didn't do much. But as a pitcher, you come across uh, much about uh, Huggins and O'Doul back in those early years. They and had I kind of a rough uh, existence. O'Doul at the time, uh, well, Lefty loved attention. And he wanted to be a pitcher. And he wasn't a pitcher. He could go seven innings at best. And then uh, I think John Kieran wrote that uh, Lefty had a magnificent curveball. It fooled every batter once, but never fooled anybody twice. <laughs> so he had some success in the minors. He won 25 games in the Pacific Coast League one year. Uh, and But if you look at, that's where building those uh, game logs was important. I noticed that he would get more rest between starts than you would normally see at that time. Charlie Graham, who owned the team and managed it at that time, had figured out Lefty couldn't pitch every fourth day and pitch nine innings. And you saw a difference when he pitched uh, you know, a complete game, What, how long he needed to go before he could be effective the next time. And Huggins wanted him to be a, a hitter. And the other thing is Lefty didn't work on his fielding. You know. There's a famous story about, uh, he told some good stories on himself. One of the best ones was uh, someone was passing bad checks with Lefty's name on them in New York. It had happened also in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, Lefty came and said, I understand somebody's been passing checks with my name. It's not me here. I'll cover the checks and here's my advice. Next time a guy comes in and says he's me, take him out in the alley, throw him a ball. If he catches it, it's not me. <laughs> And uh, so uh, he he didn't work on his defense, which I think really irritated Huggins. And he was a tremendous hitter. I mean, he he overnight when he finally decided to switch, he hit 392 in the in the most toughest minor league there was, and uh, hit 398 later in the majors, which shows you he was a major league hitter before he got to the major leagues. And uh, I think there was there was some difficulty there. And Lefty has one of the weirdest careers you'll ever see. The closest thing you can see is like the 1950s bonus babies who had to sit 
on the bench for two years because they couldn't go to the minors. He had kind of a similar career. He hardly ever played. He sat there for three years out of four. He was one, one year in the minors and three years just sat, appeared in three, 10, eight games the whole year. And uh, so that didn't help his progress either. But yeah, he and he and Huggins had kind of a, a difficult, he would make fun of Huggins behind his back sometimes. Huggins was a very nervous guy and Lefty would be mimicking him and Huggins would say, take a seat on the bench and he'd skip down like a schoolgirl and say, I'll take my place, teacher, and stuff. So there was some interesting moments with him. You know, I wonder with Huggins passing away late in 1929, and I think that was really the breakout year in the majors, wasn't that for o O'Doul? I never came across anything where there... Huggins made any comment about, oh, I told you so, or I knew you could be a great hitter. I, I wonder, because obviously Huggins lived long enough to see almost all that season and yeah. see you know, how good he was. Well, I mean, you you, you certainly, with your part, writing partner, know Huggins yeah. pretty well. I I have your book and, and really enjoyed it. And I... I I don't know. I don't, I don't, I didn't run across anything either where he talked about, I would, I did see uh, O'Doul talk about how he had been stubborn and should have listened to Huggins later in life, but I didn't, I agree. I, yeah. I never ran across anything where Huggins really talked about uh, O'Doul later and said, yeah, like I told you so. <laughs> well, Dennis, I want to thank you again. This has been a very enjoyable evening and I think, you know, everybody here had had a good time. So much appreciated. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. All right. And Thank hopefully, much. yeah. Okay. Oh, and ahead. hopefully, we'll see everybody here again in uh, another three months and with another Dead Bull era book talk. Take are, care, everybody. Are all these, are all these recorded and available on the Saber website, uh, Dan? Yes, uh, Jacob will tell you where they are. I think there, there's a there's a Saber YouTube channel, and these are all available at the Saber YouTube oh. channel, as is the one you were on. Right. Yes, that's right. You can go to the events page on the Saber website, and you can click on uh, the archive for all the virtual events, and they'll all be there. Wow! Great. Thanks. Thanks again, everybody. Thank you.